From 1933 until the end of the Second World War, German aviation led the world in aerodynamic design and technical innovation. Long before the outbreak of hostilities, German industry produced an armada of technically superior warplanes. When war broke out, the Luftwaffe quickly overwhelmed some of Europe's most vaunted air forces. Classic designs like the BF-109 fighter and Ju-88 proved to be superior fighting machines, while others like the Blumenvoss BV-141 became one of aviation's true oddities. Germany's plan for war in Europe called for an air force that was to be used in direct support of its ground forces. The Luftwaffe's task was to sweep the skies clear of enemy fighters, then destroy enemy troops and installations. Key to the Luftwaffe's success were ground attack aircraft like the Henschel 123 and Ju-87 dive bomber. Ordered in 1934, the Henschel 123 proved to be a rugged and reliable aircraft. It would see service well into 1944. Ground attack was only effective when good battlefield observation and reconnaissance could locate enemy targets. That job was given to the Henschel 126. With its excellent low-speed short field characteristics, an outstanding all-round view, the HS-126 proved a great success in the early campaigns of 1939 and 1940. The HS-126 would see action on every front, but by 1941 its limited performance was beginning to show and a new battlefield reconnaissance aircraft was needed. This led to some of the war's most unusual designs. The Blumen Voss Company was one of the first to respond with their BV-141. Designed around the concept of maximum all-round view, the BV-141 was in many ways a problem looking for a solution. The unorthodox design featured an asymmetric layout with the radial engine installed at the front end of a port side tail boom and an extensively glazed crew nacelle mounted to starboard. Unusual and radical in design, the BV-141 performed surprisingly well, but in the end it was considered too unconventional and it was cancelled in 1943. Yes, in my meandering throughout Germany, um, just after the capitulation, um, I was looking for unusual or advanced technology aircraft. And the 141 intrigued me a little when I had heard that they were at an airfield called Grossenhain, which was quite near Meissen. Um, there was a big reconnaissance unit which had many reconnaissance types of aircraft. And I thought maybe the 141 will appear there. So I flew there and um, there was no sign of one, but I asked if I could speak to some of the POWs who were uh, in the cage there. And um, one of the chaps told me that um, a 141 had indeed been there, but the last he remembered of it was not too long ago. It had had an engine problem while flying nearby and had landed on an emergency strip east of uh, Grossenheim. So I flew over in that direction looking for this strip, but it wasn't really a strip I found, it was a small airfield. And uh, it was, by well, this time I'd moved into the Russian occupation zone. And um, I decided to land there because I had already found that at that stage, after the war, the Russians were still very amenable to the Brits. 
because we had come into the early stages of the war to help them. Anyway, when I landed, um, there weren't a lot of aircraft there, and um, there was a Russian commissar and with an interpreter, and I asked if there was a 141 there. He didn't really know things like the aircraft numbers, and but he said there were one or two aircraft left, but his people had been, had ex examined their field, taken away what they wanted, and the rest was left for destruction. So I said, could I have a look around and see what it was? He said, well, yes, why not? Because it's all going to be destroyed anyway. And um, in one hangar, there was indeed a 141. It had regularly had its engines run up by Felt Babel, who um, was available. And I said to him, was the aircraft flyable? And he, he declared, oh, yes, it was. Um, I rather s suspected his motive, so I wasn't too sure of what he was saying or, or believing what he was saying, because I think he had hoped I would fly him out of there and out of the Russian zone. <clears throat> but uh, the Russians were obviously not going to play with that. Anyway, I thought I'll take his word for it and have a go at this. And um, the commissar didn't object. He said, as long as I stayed within sight of the airfield, and I'd only have enough fuel to do that, um, he didn't mind because um, it was <laughs> due for destruction anyway. <laughs> and uh, so he let me fly that. And I had about 30 to 40 minutes in it to try out this theory that it flew very nicely. Um, in a straight line when at uh, on an angle of bank of 90 degrees and uh, after about two or three goes at this at various speeds and heights I had trouble with the engine so I had to return to base and um, so I formed an impression that it probably did what it said it could do but its real reason for failing, in my opinion, was it certainly wasn't an aircraft in the same category of handling as the Focke-Wulf 189, which I had already flown, and was its competitor. Another odd-looking aircraft was the Focke-Wulf 189. The completely glazed central nacelle, twin engines and tail booms, were considered too radical for conservative Luftwaffe officials. Performance, however, won the day. Known as the Flying Eye, the FW-189 proved supremely versatile, universally popular, and one of the most reliable aircraft ever to see Luftwaffe service. During combat operations, the FW-189 surpassed all expectations. Despite flying low over the battlefield, and taking large amounts of damage. It had the ability to absorb punishments and fight another day. So I think that killed it more than the theory that um, it gave the, the gunner a wonderful field of fire by having no um, starboard half of the tailplane and um, being asymmetrically offset to give a few a clear field of fire to the gunner. So that was my experience of it. Not very impressive, um, but um, interesting. The Arado 234 was a beautiful looking airplane. Aesthetically, it was very clean and looked dynamic, aerodynamically. Very attractive. And um, the cockpit was unusual. It was a glass cockpit right at the nose, and it uh, reminded me, when I got into it, rather of like being in a helicopter. You were stuck right out in the front there with completely clear vision around you. On the other hand, you were sitting pretty close to the accident if it had to happen too. And um, my first meeting with the 234 wasn't a very happy event because this was up at Grover in Denmark. 
where we found a number of two, three, fours. And I had one prepared for a flight by the German crew, because we obviously didn't have the expertise to deal with it at that stage. And um, I taxied it out to the end of the runway. I was well aware, of course, that the Jumo 004 engines, so fitted to it, had a scrap life, total scrap life of 25 hours. So one really needed to know the service history of the engines you were flying. Now the Germans were very, very adept at destroying documentation and we could find no service records. However, I taxied out to the end of the runway at Grover and um, revved up to full power, ready for takeoff, and then just about to release the brakes when the starboard engine exploded and totally disintegrated, taking most of the starboard wing with it. And um, this, of course, could have mean one of two things. Either the crew had sabotaged it, or uh, it was an engine with 24 hours and 50 minutes on it. We never got to the bottom of what caused it, but uh, let, suffice it to say that I must have flown something like three to 400 hours on the Jumo 004 and various aircraft, and um, never had another problem with it after that. So it did not um, give me a poor impression of the 234. On the contrary, when I flew it, it was a very nice aircraft to handle at a very fast turn of speed. Uh, it was, it could fly at and cruise, and, well, its top speed was 474 miles an hour, which was very high. And of course, it relied on this speed for its survival because it had no guns fitted to it and um, was purely a reconnaissance bomber as such. But as I say, handled beautifully. It was straight wing, was not swept wing, and um, made a very good impression. Junkers Ju-52, affectionately known by those who flew her as Iron Annie, or Auntie Yu, or simply Auntie. The trimotor transport, which also served as a bomber, was to become a legend, not only for her longevity, but also for her flexibility. She was in fact as much a symbol of the Luftwaffe as the Stuka and the 109. The Ju-52 was like the DC two and three, I would say an iconic aircraft because its reliability, three-engined aircraft, very, very reliable, and uh, one wonders why they were more frequently used in uh, the UK and the USA, three-engined layout, because it was very common in Italy, it was used quite widely in Germany, and uh, but you just have rare cases of it in the states, like the trimotor Ford. Uh, but it's a great solution. The Ju-52 was constructed with the same corrugated material that the Junkers Company was to rely upon for over two decades, going back almost to the Great War. During this period. Aircraft much larger than the 52, such as the Behemoth Junker G-38, also used the same cladding. However, as the 30s came to a close, Junker's corrugated hallmark was starting to look a little tired, especially compared with other foreign types like the American DC-2 and DC-3. Nevertheless, Auntie still stayed in service. 
The Junkers company had in fact designed a replacement for Aunty prior to the start of World War II. Although they still wanted to retain its trimotor configuration, it was in most other respects a totally new aircraft. The GU 252. It was a distinct difference from the very famous JU 52. It had uh, smooth stressed wings and a very large cargo fuselage capacity. One of the main features about it was it had a wonderful loading ramp, uh, which was operated hydraulically at the back end of the aeroplane. Now, this was a tailwheel aeroplane, but after landing, um, the ramp could be operated and would come down and raise the aircraft's tail. And it was absolutely top-notch. And the incredible thing about it was we actually did experiments to see how this thing would react on the airplane in flight. And at the large enemy aircraft exhibition in October of 1945, we flew this aircraft with a ramp fully open and as a gimmick, we had uh, a chap sitting on one of the lower steps on the ramp, obviously with a harness attached, but he was sitting there pretending to smoke a cigarette. Well, it appealed very heavily to the crowds, and it was quite surprising that this aircraft had this tremendous range of central gravity and... Uh, was very trimmable in that situation. The JU-252 had a stablemate, the JU-352, which was made largely of wood to reduce the use of aluminum. The JU-352 proved less successful, although they were the first transport types to use a tailgate ramp that provided a flat surface for loading. Between the two models, only 65 examples were actually produced. When Germany was attacked on two fronts in 1944, they went out of production, as the priority was more fighters to defend the Fatherland. Another military transport which used a rear ramp also came from the drafting boards of Junkers. The JU-290 evolved from the four-engine Junkers 90 airliner, which showed great promise as an advanced design just before the war. The JU-90 airliner, like most other aircraft of the time, was a tail dragger. So when Junkers created a transport version, they employed the same lifting tailgate developed for the earlier 252. For the time, the JU-290 transport was a large aircraft when it first came into service in August of 1942. When I flew the JU-290, I was very impressed with it in the sense that it had a, a lovely cockpit layout, a very comfortable layout. It was obviously a civil aircraft adapted to a military uh, role, rather like the Fokker Wolf 200. Um, it was almost similarly armed, not quite so heavily armed as the Fokker Wolf 200, but um, flew very nicely. And I think it would have made a, a comfortable, with a little adaptation, a comfortable transatlantic um, piston engine aircraft in the early days. In fact, after the war, of course, uh, the Americans, uh, they had a group like I had uh, retrieving aircraft, German aircraft after the war. They were called Watson's Whizzers. And Colonel Watson actually flew the J-290 back to America via Bermuda. And um, he was very impressed with it, as indeed I was too. It was certainly the largest land-based powered aircraft in the Luftwaffe inventory. 
The Type was eight foot longer than the airliner version, had more powerful engines and a very considerable range. It had been claimed, although never proven, that it made direct flights between Germany and Japan. There was also a need for smaller transports, even smaller than Auntie Yu. This need was filled by the conversion of a medium-sized glider into a powered aircraft. The Gotha 244 became available in 1943, created by the simple addition of two small radial engines to a standard production glider. The radials were actually made in occupied France and as such had little impact on German war production. About 130 of the type were made and proved useful in moving small numbers of troops or light vehicles over short distances. Using the same glider to power plane conversion, the massive Messerschmitt 323 was another attempt to maximize the Luftwaffe's airborne assets. The Gigant, I saw the four-engine version and the six-engine version of the Gigant. In fact, I taxied uh, the six-engine version. It wasn't airworthy, but I taxied it just as a matter of interest. It was a vast airplane. Of light, of course, and um, the one I attached was the the D model, and it had six uh, gnome Rome uh, engines, and uh, the four engine one had proved difficult, inadequate number of engines, and still had to have some assisted takeoff, such as JATO um, or rocket uh, assistance on takeoff. As few gliders towed by aircraft like the Heinkel 111Z, they were a failure in my opinion. They, um, you had three Heinkel aircraft playing around with this, or, or the large Z, and all of them, the whole thing was a very dicey operation indeed. But once you got the six-engine version going, it was practicable, but of course, it was a large, sluggish airplane. Because of its great size and slow speed, the ME-323 was a sitting duck, and many were destroyed by the Allies. But when escorted by fighters, its ability to carry large loads was much valued by the Wehrmacht especially in the mayhem that became the Eastern Front. Blumen Voss built another remarkable transport aircraft, a long-range flying boat named the Viking. The BV-222 story is not unlike the JU-90s. It was originally ordered as a commercial flying boat. However, as the war approached, the Viking evolved into a large military transport, which also performed some patrol duties. Six powerful engines propelled the Viking. At first, they were fueled with gasoline, but the BV-222 was intended to be refueled at sea by submarines. Since U-boats are driven by diesel, the practical solution was to convert the Viking to diesel engines. Blumenvoss had another prototype flying boat that was even more advanced. The BV-238 was designed to cope with harsher sea conditions than the Viking could handle. Working only with U-boats, it was expected to go on very lengthy missions. It was designed to be almost self-supporting and able to deal with many types of heavy cargo. To assist in loading the 238, it was equipped with a massive forward waterproof door in the bow. This could be employed in a similar manner to landing craft on a beachhead. What you see here is only a service hatch set within the waterproof door. To assist in handling cargo there were derricks and winches located on the hull, making the BV-238 more like a merchant ship than an aircraft. 
There was also a tunnel which ran the length of both wings, providing internal access to the six engines, even when the flying boat was in the air. Only one BV-238 was completed. It was destroyed by Allied fighters just before the end of the war. The final example of Luftwaffe gigantism came in the form of the Junkers 390, a stretch 290 with a very capacious 110 feet long fuselage. Propelling this enormous aircraft would require two more engines than the Ju-290 and a much greater wing over 160 feet in span. The extra wing length actually required an additional set of wheels on each side to support the craft as it landed. Only two Junkers 390s were ever built, but even these required enormous resources both in labor and material. After the war, only one of the Ju 390s was ever accounted for. This led to speculation as to what happened to the other aircraft, as the Type had more range than any other German plane. When they already had a proven workhorse in the Ju-52, why did the Third Reich become so preoccupied with limited numbers of large transport aircraft? One possibility was that Germany had not prepared for a long war. The premise of Blitzkrieg was achieving quick victory by lightning attacks. The English Channel stymied Blitzkrieg against Britain. With the rapid fall of France, crossing the Channel became the Wehrmacht's primary objective. This could partially be achieved by gliders, which led to large transport planes like the Gigant. Often overlooked, there was one other design that evolved in the Fatherland during those turbulent years. The Arado 232, sometimes called the Millipede. Just after Germany invaded Poland, the Air Ministry issued a request for a replacement for the Ju-52. It must be equipped with a rare entry ramp and would employ two of the recently developed BMW 801 radial engines. Arado designers quickly came up with a brilliant design that embraced all the latest thinking in transport aircraft. It had a rare loading ramp, but unlike most other medium-sized transports of the time, it used a tricycle undercarriage. This type of wheel arrangement would not usually work in rough terrain. However, Arado engineers solved the problem by placing a row of small rollers under each side of the fuselage. If necessary, the main gear could be adjusted to kneel the plane down. The 232 would then simply crawl over obstacles on its many rollers, which led to its nickname, the Millipede. At the end of World War II, we were, of course, interested in bringing quite a lot of heavy stuff back from Germany, um, uh, like wind tunnel gear and even aeroplanes. And uh, we were looking for cargo planes. We used a German aircraft called the Arado 232, uh, known as the Millipede because of the large number of bogey wheels that it had in, as uh, part of its undercarriage layout. And uh, this was a most effective uh, system of operating on grass airfields, which abounded in Germany in the early stages, and uh, where traction was very difficult to find under adverse weather conditions. The Millipede's level loading ramp made it ideal for all types of cargo. But the Arado 232 had a major problem. It came in the form of this plane, the very successful Fokker Wolf 190, known as the Butcher Bird. The 190 used the same BMW 801 radial engines envisioned for the new Arado transport. After the German failure at the Battle of Britain, there was no doubt that the new FW90 had priority for the BMW engines. The Arado would have to look elsewhere for suitable power plants. 
but there were none with the same power as the BMW 801. To solve this problem, a four-engine millipede was proposed with a larger wing. This change led to delays. The end result was that possibly the best military transport of the Second World War was limited to a production run of less than 20 examples, leaving Auntie to soldier on alone. Eventually, almost 5,000 JU-52s were made. Many continued to fly around the world for a number of years after the war, including some with the RAF. But Auntie was not their only Luftwaffe transport. Two Arado 232 millipedes were also flown by the Royal Air Force.